and Counterpoint. I'm Richard Field. We're live on Channel 17 in Sacramento at 8 p.m. Thursday, uh, noon Friday, and 4 a.m. on Saturday, all Pacific time. And we're on the web at uh, accesssacramento.org, Channel 17, also on YouTube and, uh, and Facebook and uh, elsewhere, uh, cable channels elsewhere. So thank you very much for being part of the show. I'd like to welcome John Lederer, Portfolio Manager, and uh, Brett Owens, the Chief Investment Strategist at Contrarian Outlook. Got a couple of finance guys here, so we can talk <laughs> finance tonight. Excellent. And you can't really talk finance without talking about the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States, the Fed, uh, our central bank. Uh, it seems that the, well, one of the roles, the assigned roles of the Fed, is to set interest rates. In other words, control the price <clears throat> at which people can borrow money or businesses can borrow money. We know from the 1970s, the Nixon wage and price control eras, that, that uh, uh, price controls don't work very well, or at least they have unforeseen consequences. Why is it any different for money, for one entity, the Fed, one group of a half a dozen individuals to set the price of money? Why should that work better than wage price controls in general? I, mean, I think your point's valid. I think it doesn't work very well. And if you look at the track record of the Fed over the last several decades, I mean, you know, the period of the 70s, like you talked about, I mean, arguably the Fed kept interest rates too low. And then, you know, they haven't had the ability to forecast the economy very well. I mean, if you think back to the year before the financial crisis and Ben Bernanke was talking about how the subprime housing uh, issue was contained. And, you know, a year or so later, we have the one of the worst recessions we've had in the last century. So to think that there's this entity, even though there's a lot of talented people there and they have a lot of data and a lot of uh, economists there, I mean, they're no different. They can't predict the future any better than anybody else. And so to think that there's this entity that should be able to come in and set pricing and not let the market do it, I think we've seen some of the uh, really uh, unfortunate consequences of, of what's resulted from that. You mentioned the 2007-2008 uh, the financial crisis where the Fed all, you know, really lowered interest rates to zero or below. They also started buying a whole lot of bonds. They bought most of the Treasury issue, uh, a, a really good large chunk of the subprime mortgage bond uh, issues that were mm -hmm. out there looking for, looking for a market where there was no other. Uh, and in the process, uh, amassed a multi-trillion dollar uh, balance sheet uh, uh, in their portfolio. Uh, in the last uh, year or two years, something like that, they've been trying to unload that portfolio. Is that going to continue? Well, we'll see. I mean, you know, for a while, you know, it depends on, you know, Powell, you know, was a couple months ago was talking about tightening policy more than people were expecting. And then all of a sudden the stock market start to waver a little bit. And now he's kind of done a bit of an about face. And I think you saw when uh, Lyle Brainerd, one of the other Fed governors was talking about um, curtailing that that runoff program. So I think, you know, they, they want to keep the financial markets happy, it would seem. And so I think you know, they got jittery when there was talk of tightening policy more than expected. And so I think that uh, we might see them back off it a little bit more. You're a portfolio manager. You do. I, I'm assuming you do stock and bond allocation. Yes, that's and, part uh, of what I do for high uh, net worth clients. Yes. Pick, pick stocks for uh, portfolios, that sort of thing. Yes, that's part of it. Yes. And, and traditionally, you know, uh, Benjamin Graham model, you would find stocks that uh, look like they're going to earn more money. Uh, and are priced fairly and so forth, uh, you would judge uh, what you're going to buy, what you're going to put in the portfolio based on the relative merits of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, now you have to pay a lot more attention, I'm assuming you have to pay a lot more attention to what the feds are doing than exactly. you do to what the companies are actually doing. Totally. I mean, when you, when you talked about earlier the feds quantitative easing program, when they were doing that back, especially in like 10, 19, uh, 2000, uh, 12, 2013, I mean, it didn't really matter what the company looked like. There was so much liquidity coming into the marketplace that, you know, that tide was lifting all companies. There really wasn't a lot of segmentation between, you know, looking at valuations that closely. And so I think quantitative easing has really skewed the price discovery mechanism in the market um, across a lot of different areas, in addition to the stocks that you talked about. And since 2009, it's led to a very strong uh, stock market, at least as far as asset values are Correct. concerned. Correct. 
Uh, but no inflation to speak of in the consumer sector, uh, at least measured by official statistics. Correct. So is the stock, has the inflation actually gone into asset it's values instead? Totally, without a doubt. I mean, there's, uh, you know, those, you know, closest to the uh, printing press, to, so to speak, uh, <laughs> benefit at the expense of those furthest away. And I think that's one of the things you've seen. I mean, it's no different than, you know, flooding the markets li with liquidity. Um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why you've seen, you know, income inequality go up so much over the last decade. Because those who can borrow. Uh, have, those who, who, have, those who, who are asset credit. owners and those who can borrow benefit, you know, it doesn't yeah. really help the, a lot of the other people out there. And, and it's, you, you know, got to have money to borrow money. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, you are in the, in the business of recommending uh, stocks, I guess, for, with your with your newsletter. That's right. We're in a in a uh, interest rate, a low interest rate environment, which makes it really difficult for people of retirement. Age. What are you telling your 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 readers to to do face, in, in facing that kind of a, a situation? Well, they need to get out from the common stocks and bonds that everyone looks at. So you see a common mistake that you'll see retirees make is they look at the blue chips, dividend aristocrats, a Johnson and Johnson, a General Mills, and they'll try to grind out enough income from those types of stocks. So you're looking at something paying two, three, four percent. It looks better than a 10-year treasury, which pays three percent. So they say, okay, well, maybe I'll take on a little more risk. I'll buy a stock and I can get an extra half percent, extra percent. The problem is you're taking on a lot of risk to get only 30,000, 35,000 in annual income on a million bucks. So you're putting a million dollars at risk and you've got 30, 35,000 dollars in annual income. And who so, has a million dollars to start with? And who has a million dollars to start with? <laughs> so what you need to do is take that hypothetical million, 500K, whatever you're working with as a retiree, and put it into higher yielding issues that aren't bought by the big guys, the big pension funds. So we're talking about things like real estate investment trusts, trusts uh, closed end funds, uh, stocks and funds with market caps of a billion, two billion, five billion, which is plenty liquid for you and me to take our hypothetical million and get into, but the big guys can't get in and out of these. So you will see outsized yields in these corners of the market that tend to be a little less efficient. So that's where you need to look today because just buying a 10 year treasury is not gonna get you the income unless you're already, unless you're already rich. <laughs> well, one of the uh, uh, phenomena that we're facing right now is we've had a, a bull run since 2009, essentially, uh, had a little bit of a hiccup from uh, November or September through uh, through uh, January, but now we're back. On, it looks like we're back in the bull run. That's a long time. That's I think the longest bull, bull uh, market in history, perhaps. Yeah, either the longest or the second longest. Yeah. Uh, and uh, how how much longer can, can that go on? Are we reaching a, a point where valuations are higher than uh, is is warranted, according to Benjamin Graham? No, I mean, that's that's the great question, because, you know, in addition to the fact that you've got this economic you know, recovery that we've had since the middle of 2009, I mean, we're getting to the point where it's the longest recovery we've had. I mean, they started measuring these things in the 1850s, you know, a couple quarters from here. We're at the longest one we ever had. And so you got to wonder, like, how much longer can this thing keep going? And, you know, in order to have buoyant financial markets you need to have economic growth. So if the, mar if the economy to were to roll over with the valuations being high, so to speak, I mean, it's something that definitely keeps me up at night. It's hard, especially when you're the steward of other people's money. Sure. And, uh, you know, at the same time, you can't get too conservative because if this thing goes on for a little bit longer, you know, clients aren't happy about that either. So it's definitely a... Uh, it's a bit stressful in that regard, I would say. Well, one of the things that, that interests me is the, the fact that uh, with all of the manipulation of what's going on in the stock market, let's call it that, by, or, or, or the, Fed, the Federal Reserve Board, manipulation of interest rates, which affects the stock market mm -hmm. and the bond market and so on, <clears throat> we still have a vibrant uh, under, underlying economy. We still have a tech sector that's growing very nicely, thank you very much, right? That's right. Yeah. Tech is uh, it's growing nicely. It is growing at the expense of some other sectors. So tech is eating a lot of uh, things. You have Amazon out there, which is kind of gobbling up the brick and mortar retailers. Uh, many of the software companies, so Google, Facebook, why are they doing so well? Well, they're taking out the traditional advertising models. Uh, more and more money goes into advertising online, which means you're buying ads on Google, Facebook, uh, but that money's going out of other places. So mm -hmm. tech is definitely it's a winner take all kind of economy. 
tech is the place to be. It's been outperforming uh, for a little while here. Um, I One of the interesting theories on recession is that some <coughs> sectors have already had a recession. So you've had retail that's gotten clobbered and, uh, a couple of years ago, and home builders have gotten clobbered. So you're almost seeing a, a rolling type of recession where some sectors can be strong. And it, it might be that we see tech continue to stay strong while what tech eats gets taken out in the process. So you want to be in the strong, uh, stronger names, stronger sectors. Think of those Amazon proof kind of business models. If you're, if you're buying a stock and it doesn't have an Amazon proof story or, or feel to it, it might only be a matter of uh, days, weeks, or months before Bezos gets on and announces that Amazon's getting into this business and then boom, you're down 30% overnight. So that's the important thing I think today is to stay uh, to your point in the stronger sectors such as tech, uh, such as the real estate investment trust we talked about earlier where hey, what's Amazon proof? Maybe I can get a, a hospital landlord that just owns a bunch of hospitals and collects rent checks, and these hospitals are gonna be in demand no matter what happens in the broader economy. So you feel good about staying in something like that and collecting an outsized maybe five, six percent yield versus reaching, being in an index where certain stocks, certain sectors may be doing okay, and other ones might be getting eaten alive as their business models become obsolete overnight. And uh, the, 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 the increase in, in tech, I mean, we, we read a lot about, uh, or hear a lot about uh, the uh, internet needing regulation because, uh, I, I forget the, 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 the technical term, but uh, people on the left are complaining that- uh, Net neutrality. Yeah, net neutrality, yeah. that's mm -hmm. what I'm looking mm -hmm. for. Uh, is that necessary? Is there any reason at all to think that uh, uh, it's required to have some sort of uh, government regulation in order to make uh, internet access available to pretty much everybody. Well, if you look at sectors over the last 20 years and see where the most innovation has been, uh, it's hard to argue that tech is not number one. And uh, the reason is that nobody knows how to regulate it because very few, anyone who saw the Facebook hearing uh, where he got tried in front of Congress, nobody understands what that website does and it's a fairly simple website. So they don't, uh, our legislators don't really understand tech they're not able to regulate it, and it's been to the great benefit of the tech industry and all of us who do uh, benefit from uh, tech type of So products. would it be too great of a generalization to say that which is lightly regulated or not at all does a heck of a lot better than industries which are under the heavy hand of regulation, uh, say utilities or uh, some of the uh, pharmaceutical companies, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I look at uh, utilities, many utilities back to our retirement income discussion. Many investors buy utilities for the dividends and utilities, they're government guaranteed profits, but they are being heavily regulated. Most of these firms don't increase their dividends very fast. The Southern Company, some of these uh, Duke Energy, some of the big blue chip uh, utilities, you'll get the dividend, but you're not getting a lot of dividend growth because, I mean, what are these companies actually doing on the innovation side? Well, and that's what I'm thinking. Since they are so highly regulated and since they have essentially uh, uh, protection from competition, they've got huge moats, uh, legal moats in, in the case of utilities. Uh, is it not true that the uh, innovation at a, at, a power, at a southern company or, or uh, Duke Energy or somebody like that doesn't exist compared to the energy at, a, at a, uh, uh, an Intel or a company that is rapidly trying to uh, build the, the next better mousetrap. Oh, sure. Yeah, they just don't need to. So if you're looking at, if you were just doing a, some sort of passive investing model on where you wanted to be, uh, you could maybe go along the less regulated stocks and sectors and uh, stay away from the heavily regulated ones because that's where you're getting less growth. Okay, so so does that would that is that one good explanation? Uh, less regulation that explains the uh, outperformance of tech compared to uh, the more regulated old economy. The less regulation is a, is a big part of it. Now, I, I think where there might be concerns going forward is that you're down to you got four or five tech companies that do everything, so they've been able to eat a lot of the competition. Now you're turning into a kind of an old school, if not monopoly, yeah. kind of uh, oligopoly here, where they've uh, uh -huh. eaten up everyone. So we'll see going forward because do they now that Google, Amazon have almost turned themselves into utilities? Uh, do they have uh, unregulated, unregulated utilities? Do they okay, well, have that, that innovative motivation? And, and they're crying, and, and politicians now and the left are, are crying out for regulation of them precisely for that reason. Uh, Facebook is doing things that people don't appreciate, so they need to be regulated, right? Or go to a different competitor, maybe? 
but they they, they're I, I smart enough true. where they they buy up the competitor before they get too big. So they paid a, a billion dollars for Instagram uh, a few years back. Instagram had 12 nerds working for them, and everyone thought it was crazy, and they overpaid. And Instagram's worth uh, a heavily multiple on, on top of that. You see Google, they bought up YouTube. They paid a billion sum for YouTube. YouTube's worth way more than a billion dollars now. So these companies have been very <laughs> smart with uh, their, their purchases. So mm -hmm. they've got uh, capital. They basically print money with their stock. Uh, stock's always going up, so they, they've got uh, flush access to money. Plus, these businesses just generate uh, cash. They're cash machines, and then they're able to gobble up the competition. Okay. Uh, so so what's, what's, the, what's the solution of getting the rest of the economy to be as competitive uh, and as innovative and as progressive as the tech part of the economy? Well, you want to regulate it less. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> okay. Education is one of the most highly regulated uh, institutions uh, in the country. In fact, it's government run for the most part. It's certainly uh, uh, elementary, secondary education is almost entirely government. And uh, the uh, college sector is probably, I don't know what the percentages are, but it's a majority, a majority run by, by uh, states uh, and, and government institutions. Um, and yet we're not at the top of the list when it comes to educational outcomes compared to other countries. What can a highly regulated institution like schools do, or what can parents do, more to the point, what can parents do when they're facing uh, a not particularly responsive and, not, and a very highly regulated uh, educational establishment? Yeah, I mean, you know, we deal with this. I have three kids. Mm -hmm. Two of them are in school right now, and so we deal with this a lot. And so I think one of the things that uh, my wife and I try to do is, like, make sure that they're all, you know, teach them to become very self-reliant, teach them to, you know, take initiative and do things and, you know, try to, you know, a lot of times, you know, it involves us doing a lot of teaching and supplementing what they're learning and really try to un have them understand, you know, why do these things happen, especially with historical events and things like that, and prodding them and, and getting them to kind of step ahead and do a little bit more. Because otherwise, you know, they can pass their tests pretty easily by just memorizing things and kind of getting through, and they may not know it and kind of be able to take that uh, you know, apply it as they, as they get, it, you know, especially as they get older. So trying to teach those skills, um, you know, and supplement that, I think, is something that we try to do in our own household. So public schools, but... Uh, well, they actually go to private schools, okay. but it's the same, same, same concept of why. <laughs> okay, they, they, they're, they're uh, in many performing less well than they might be, have they? Uh, well, I mean, they perform very well in their school, but I think there's things, you know, better, as they get older, I think, yeah. you know, I try to teach them, I mean, the world's a very competitive place, you know, I try to tell them, you know, it's not just the, you know, 24 kids in your class. You're going to be competing against this, you know, billions of, of kids around the world, especially mm -hmm. as you get older with, you know, the advent of technology and a global workforce. So I said, you know, you got to be at the top of your game. So you does that include uh, having your kids go out and mow lawns to make money, sell lemonade, that, that sort of thing? You're a funny man. Yeah. <laughs> I would like the reason I asked is because in, in, in the uh, nanny state helicopter parenting, call your call the cops if if a kid is walking the dog Correct, yes. in the wrong neighborhood. Uh, it, it, does it make does that make it more difficult? I say it does. I mean, um, you know, there's times where like even like you know leaving my kids at home sometimes. You know, like I'll leave. I have a you know almost 13 year old and she's old and she has a babysitting credential now and so. She's old enough to stay and babysit, but, you know, she's still nervous about being left alone at the house sometimes. So it's mm -hmm. hard to kind of, you know, really get that independence going within her. But, you know, they also, my daughters have sold lemonade. They have done some things to be a little bit entrepreneurial. So we try to encourage that whenever possible. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I would, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, be, you know, riding bareback horse. For sure. All over the, all over the countryside, you know, driving my dad's tractor, uh, baling hay, you know, doing all kinds yeah. of, driving the tractor on the highway. For, for to, sure, to yeah. When, when, I, when I grew up, and I was probably like eight years old, uh, I would stay with my grandma for a few weeks during the summer, and we would walk probably half a mile. You know, my sister and I would walk by our, she was younger than I was, we'd walk by ourselves half a mile to the store and go get food and do other things like that and I think about that yeah. now and it's like holy smokes I can't even fathom that oh, I'm now. so I'm so old that I went to a one-room country school for the first four years of my education and walked a mile and a half mm -hmm. in the snow both ways uphill both face, ways yeah, yeah. yeah uphill both ways perfect in the snow storm, yeah. so okay so but you're but you're figuring out a way to, to, to deal 
With we're all trying to, yeah, we're trying to do the best we can with it. I would. Do you say. have experience in this re- in this realm as we well? We just toured kindergarten, <laughs> so we've got some fresh experience. So we did find a couple of innovative schools that we did like a lot. Okay. We let our daughter choose which one. Which uh, one they, did she choose? They, they did both have to be private schools. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, as a public school kid myself, yeah. I never thought we would be on the private track for um, for her duration, but. Um, yeah, it's tough. It goes back to our regulation conversation. We we toured a, a public school, and it was it was really a cute school and and well run. They did as good a job, I think, as 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 they can given the constraints. But that's kind of the thing they're teaching to this required curriculum by the state. Yeah. So they've got they're beholden to that. They are not allowed to mix and match grades. So the uh, kindergarten that we chose, they go all the way up to eighth grade. If your kid is good at a certain subject, they go up to the first grade, they go with the first graders, they go with the second graders, they keep rolling along. So they mix and match along the grades based on how they are and they split it up by subject. Public school can't do that. They're just not allowed to do that. They got to split segment by grade. Uh, It says that the government was running something. So they're segmented by grade. They're there for the year and it's the school that we all remember. One of the things about education that fascinates me the most right now is that we have uh, a perceived crisis in uh, student debt for college uh, education, and it, and it's it's real. I mean, kids are graduating from from college with uh, uh, you know forty, fifty, hundred thousand uh, dollar debt, and, and quite often in degrees uh, in liberal arts degrees or political science degrees or or sociology degrees that are not really going to provide uh, a career that will that's remunerative enough to to pay off those college loans. So you end up with a lot of people, you know, trying to pay their college loans with two jobs as baristas. Um, and at the same time, we've been, you know, as why is that? And when I went to college, uh, it was $150 was my uh, fees for the entire quarter. That was it. Living expenses were, you know, relatively mm-hmm. inexpensive. I could, I could, in fact, work my way, way through college and did so. That's not possible anymore. I, I know that because I've got a, a, a daughter that just graduated from college and, and she worked you know, pretty much, you know, all the way through, but dad had to pay a, a whole lot of the uh, tuition and so forth because it's not $150 a quarter anymore. Right. It's more, you know, public school is more like $12,000, $15,000 a year. So the people who have to borrow in order to, uh, to fu- fund that, they're, they're starting off kind of behind the eight ball. And I tie that to the fact that everybody who has the ability to fog a mirror can get a college loan. Uh, and, and does. And uh, college loans, of course, are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. So the colleges kind of have the students right where, you know, right, right where they want them. If you want to come to college, that's fine. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll, get, you know, we'll make sure that you can get a loan. You're going to have to pay our higher tuition, and you end up with a, a college system that has a whole lot of people in the administrative area not that many people in the classroom doing a lot of research probably but you're not getting the value for the money in college anymore right? am i am yeah I, off on that? I mean if you look at it over the last 40 plus years if you look at the two highest areas of inflation education health care where those two things have in common heavy level of government subsidies and those things have gone up and it's enriched you know a lot of the people working at the colleges as you say i mean Uh, I know people that when they went to UC Berkeley, that's where I went, uh, when they went there, it was free to go to UC. And now, you know, like you said, it's $12,000 a year and the cost is is high. And I think it's a major problem. And, you know, it's kind of the system has developed where, you know, easy access. If the money is there, we'll figure out a way to check it. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think it's a it's a really big problem. And, you know, I look ahead. I mean, you got to wonder at what point does it, you know, at some point, you know, you know, if something's unsustainable, you'd think it would have to come to an end. So you would think at some point the inflation's going to stop, but I just don't know when that is. I'm hoping it's before my kids go to school, but I don't know if that's <laughs> going to be the case or not. But it's, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. I mean, you're seeing it uh, nowadays. Anyway. One of the things I, th- I find fascinating about the economy that we live in is that when there is a problem, the market will usually find a way to solve the problem. Uh, it's been demonstrated, I think, without question, that smoking cigarettes is a problem. You get lung cancer and die and have other you know, bad results, emphysema and so forth and so on. And uh, the amount of uh, smoking has gone down by people who just you know, quit cold turkey and so forth. But it's also gone down because uh, uh, innovative companies have figured out a way 
to kind of wean people off of uh, tobacco by providing vaping products, which are uh, provide the same amount of nicotine, which is not really what causes the problem, the health problem uh, in smoking. It provides the addiction, but not, not the health problem. It's the tars and, and smoke that causes the, the problem. Vaping gets away from that. It doesn't cause the problem, solves the, you know, takes care of the, of the, of the, uh, the nicotine addiction. Uh, and yet, we see the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and the state of California and regulators all over the country saying, we have to stop vaping. We have to regulate vaping. We have to do this, that, and the other thing. Why? Good question. Because <laughs> if we talk about classic libertarian values, what is it? Uh, do whatever harm you want as long as it's not to somebody else. So if you look at classic smoking, sure, you got secondhand smoke. Maybe somebody next to you doesn't enjoy that. I don't have a problem with a secondhand vape, so I could care less. Okay, but I, what's the mindset that says, the, the, the data says that vaping actually helps people quit smoking, quit smoking tobacco. That's a good thing. Therefore, we must regulate vaping and the, where it can be sold and keep minors away from it and, and you know, regulate the number of flavors and, and so forth and so on. For God's sake, they're talking about making menthol cigarettes illegal now. Uh, it's a constituent play is the only thing I could think yeah, of. Yeah, there's a lot of lobbying dollars at work, I think, is what ultimately happens in many of these cases. Okay, well, the cigarette companies are notorious, notoriously big lobbyists, mm -hmm. I would think. Uh, so where are those lobbying dollars coming from? Who's, who's, uh, uh, ben who's benefiting from the, uh, the, the war against vaping and, and well, smoking in general, but vaping in particular? I don't know. I'm not an expert in <laughs> I, I don't smoke, so I don't know if I'm a, if I, if I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in that area. So okay. I don't know. Okay. Do you do you recommend tobacco companies? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't. So are you are you a fan of ethically based investing? Yeah, I mean it's hard to do in practice, but I think you know when possible, if there's a choice, I try to to do that when possible. So I typically avoid the, you know, given a choice, I would not. I typically don't choose tobacco. Mm -hmm. Any other? Even though some of the some of the yields are pretty good, I don't think that's part of your portfolios. But uh, but uh, I typically don't do those. And any other sectors that, to avoid unethical uh, issues? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as I mean, it runs the gamut. I mean, there's so many different because I work with some charitable groups, mm -hmm. and they all have different criteria in terms of what you can do. There's some that don't like certain pharmaceutical companies for different types of testings. Um, some of the aerospace defense companies, people have problems with those. It really just depends on what your- Everybody's got their own, their own. What your, what your restrictions are. Their own, their own are. order. Right. That's the show for tonight. Thank you very much for being part of the Libertarian Counterpoint. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Uh, on Libertarian Counterpoint, thanks for watching. That's fine. I enjoy that. I heard, was there like stuff going on? Like, I